welcome everyone and thank you to Bayzem for this opportunity. So, I want to put hormones centre stage. After all, endocrine networks um, are the mechanisms by which exercise produces beneficial effects in terms of optimising health and performance. So the purpose of exercise training is to improve athletic performance. This is mediated through adaptations, physiological adaptations such as increased cardiac output, shift of the lactate tolerance curve to the right, metabolic terms, improved insulin sensitivity, and uh, metabolic flexibility. But what exactly is driving these adaptations? You guessed it, hormones. After all, the mechanism of action of hormones is to influence the expression of DNA and therefore the synthesis of proteins. So you can appreciate that any disruption to the endocrine networks is going to impair this, uh, these adaptation processes and potentially have adverse effects on health and performance. This could be due to an endocrine disruption per se or an effect of, a knock-on effect of training on the endocrine system. Because hormones are so vital to supporting uh, sports performance, this is the unfortunate spin-off that they have been uh, abused. And indeed, 95% of adverse analytical findings are hormones, and these are the usual suspects in these three categories. So turning, uh, focusing on growth hormone, um, I was, whilst I was a research fellow at St. Thomas's Hospital, I was part of the international team developing an anti-doping test for growth hormone. So why growth hormone? Well, it has um, uh, advantageous effects on the uh, body, but our problem was what is the normal range for athletes? Because after all, the normal range is composed of subsets of the population of which elite athletes might be one. Also, the two main stimuli for growth hormone release are sleep and exercise. So the first part of the project was to establish what the normal ranges are for elite athletes across a cross-section of sports. And we did this at the various international centers, UK, uh, Sweden, Denmark, and Italy. The next question is, what exactly are we going to measure? Because growth hormone, to all intents and purposes, is identical whether it's endogenous or ex exogenous. So this is in contrast to the situation with syn synthetic anabolic steroids, which have a distinct molecular structure, and so can be identified with mass spec or something like that. The other issue is that growth hormone, being a peptide hormone, has a very short half-life. So we came to the conclusion that we were going to have to focus on downstream markers of uh, growth hormone release, particularly bone turnover markers. So to find out what the effects of various doses of growth hormone and exercise were on these downstream markers. Uh, at the various centers, we performed uh, double-blind placebo-controlled studies, um, which resulted ultimately in developing a test, but also I became very good at doing VO2 max tests. The thing about doping is whatever the ergogenic effect of the uh, substance, the hormone, the point is that the athlete is taking it with the intention of taking a shortcut of cheating, and that's really the crux, not whether it has an effect or not. Of course, there is unintentional doping, but unfortunately, ignorance is not a defense, and so uh, up to a half of adverse analytical findings are because of supplements. Either contamination has occurred or simply the, the full list of ingredients has not been listed, so obviously athletes have to only, should only be advised to take sports-approved products. So the body likes to remain in a nice, stable, internal milieu through the process of homeostasis. This is, uh, there are potential disrupting effects of, of external effects of exercise and nutrition. So for example, exercising tissues release um, exokines, which are a mi mixture of peptides, nucleic acid, metabolites, and these have local autocrine and paracrine effects. And then in the hierarchy of control, that's under uh, the endocrine system plays a part, driving the adaptations which occur over there, 
during periods of recovery, and that's important to stress. So recovery and sleep is actually a very important part of any um, training schedule, because that's when the adaptations occur, driven by the endocrine networks. Maladaptation can occur, either over or under response. This could be because there's a, an issue with the endocrine network system. Um, and also, bear in mind that you do need some degree of oxidative stress to drive the adaptations in the first place. So probably swallowing loads of anti-inflammatories um, and antioxidants actually may hinder the, this process, this system of adaptation. So how to harness the endocrine system to optimize health and performance? Because after all, health is not just an absence of disease. It's positive well-being in those three areas. There. And this diagram represents um, those three variable external factors of exercise, nutrition, recovery. And so ideally, you want to be in that uh, green optimal plateau. An excess or deficiency of any of those three factors will cause you to sort of slip off the edge into the red zones. So how exactly to implement this? Uh, this was discussed at the last Bayesian conference. And the idea of prescription of diet or exercise, the issue with that is it implies compliance and there's a binary response, either yes, no. Either the patient says, no, I'm not going to do that, or yes, I will. More effective is uh, involving the patient or the athlete uh, to participate in the choice, and that's more likely to lead to adherence. So those pesky physio exercises you're given, uh, try and involve in the choice, explain the positive outcomes of doing this, and then that's more likely to be effective. This model of self-determination was shown quite neatly in a study in Australia where they took, took a group, group of people, divided it into two, uh, some were prescribed specific exercises to do. The others were um, allowed some degree of the choice uh, discussion. And then afterwards, they were offered a free choice of food. Those who had been prescribed the exercise not only ingested more calories, but more sort of unhealthy type foods. So the group that had been encouraged to take responsibility for their health, that followed through to their food choices. Of course, it's not just a matter of what, but when we eat, sleep, um, and exercise. So there are various time scales reflected in, uh, the in patterns of hormone re release internally. The hypothalamus is key. This is the neuroendocrine gatekeeper. So it um, integrates all the internal and external uh, inputs. Uh, and there is some degree of entrainment, some degree of flexibility between external um, inputs and internal biological clocks. Nevertheless, if that's really out of sync, then there's this situation of circadian uh, misalignment. And this has adverse impacts on both health and performance. So in children, increased risk of injury, shortening of the telomere length, and particularly concerning, increased risk in the long term of cardiovascular disease. Young children with adverse metabolic and inflammatory markers and reduced heart rate variability go on to be more at risk of cardiovascular disease. Uh, we're well aware now of shift work, uh, that on-call medical uh, rotor, yuck. Um, it's not good for your health. Um, you can see here, increased risk of metabolic syndrome, uh, which comprises of glucose uh, dysregulation, uh, adverse lipid profile, hypertension, and if you combine that with in inflammation, cardiovascular disease. Also impact on bone health and metabolic uh, flexibility. So the key message is you have to respect your internal biological clocks and periodize your exercise, sleep, um, and nutrition, um, bearing in mind that there are these uh, internal uh, biochronometers. So the female uh, uh, endocrine system is particularly uh, sensitive to disruption, or maybe it's because there's an obvious sign if things are disrupted in a woman. The circadian uh, release of hormones, shown here, 
this has led to the question, when is it best uh, to compete or exercise? It's been suggested in the later afternoon, evening, um, because uh, there's better control of, of glucose, blood glucose. Um, and this situation led to dis some disgruntled Olympic swimmers at the, Beige uh, at the Beijing Games, um, where the finals were put into the morning to fit in with the US TV scheduling. Everyone is slightly individual, as we know. Um, but whatever uh, circadian phenotype you are, sleep is absolutely essential. Uh, that's not my quote, by the way. Um, that's Macbeth. And actually, it really is important sleep. As I've described, very important growth hormone release during sleep to drive the adaptations. Um, and especially in the young, who have some degree of neuroplasticity, and it's been shown that there's less serious uh, long-term consequences of concussion if the child is well rested. So moving on to look specifically at why and how the female endocrine system is, is sensitive. Uh, female athlete triad. Um, we're going to hear quite a lot about this today. Barbara Drinkwater originally described a study where she took a group of collegiate runners. They were all had similar nutritional intakes, but the difference was their weekly mileage. Those that had a greater training load were more likely to suffer with menstrual disruption and therefore impaired bone mineral density. Since then, it has developed into this clinical spectrum. As you can see, it's not, an all or, it's not this binary all or nothing. There's a clinical spectrum. And it's a particularly associated, as you all know, with sports where being lightweight um, infers, confers a performance or aesthetic advantage. Um, and so in terms of ballet, if you've ever tried to do point work, you will know it is impossible to do this unless you are lightweight. And certainly absolutely impossible to do 32 fuetes onto an on point unless you are lightweight. So it's, uh, it's, it's absolutely a performance requirement almost. So this is what I want to stress, that periods are normal um, because they reflect healthy internal hormones. And you could argue that for athletes, it's even more important, from what I've just said, that they have healthy hormone as characterized in female athletes by regular menstrual cycles. And Gwen Jorgensen, you may have seen, recently posted her training uh, peaks data, and she had all her training load on there. She also had absolutely spot on regular periods, apart from when she was pregnant with her child. So it is possible to achieve this. In fact, vital to achieve this. Uh, just the definitions, these are the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists. I am aware that the US, there's a slight difference in age, but the underlying, the fundamental thing is primary amenorrhea. Uh, you should have achieved, started your periods if you're a female by the age of 16. Secondary amenorrhea, um, six months of missed periods in a previously regulating woman. And oligomenorrhea, less than nine cycles per calendar year. It's a diagnosis of exclusion. Hypothalamic, uh, functional hypothalamic. Hypothalamic amenorrhea, which is what we're talking about, is a diagnosis of exclusion. It's absolutely really important to exclude uh, underlying medical causes. Obviously, pregnancy is one. Um, ovarian causes, polycystic ovary syndrome is very common uh, in, in women. Um, and in order to be diagnosed with this, you need two out of the three diagnostic criteria. So irregular menstru uh, menstruation. By a clinical or biochemical evidence of uh, hyperandrogenism and or evidence on ultrasound of the ovaries of, well, they call it polycysts, but actually it's, it's multiple follicles. But anyway, you need two out of those three to diagnose it. The interesting thing about PCOS is although um, you see women presenting to the endocrine clinic with this, actually it's a metabolic. The fundamental issue is metabolic, similar in a way to type 2 diabetes. There's uh, elevated levels of insulin leading to insulin resistance, uh, dis, uh, abnormal uh, lipid profile. So it's very important not only to diagnose the condition for the woman, but actually to get to the fundamental issue, you sh maybe should be looking at the metabolic um, aspect of this as well, apart from the endocrine aspect. And also, it's very unusual, 
um, unlike all causes of amenorrhea, apart from pregnancy, um, estrogen actually is relatively well maintained in PCOS. Other causes um, of amenorrhea that needs to be excluded, uh, pituitary causes, and then other bits and pieces, uh, thyroid disorders, uh, CIH, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So if you're looking, considering someone uh, may have a PCOS diagnosis, you need to do 17-hydroxyprogesterone, DHEA, to exclude CIH, Cushing's, acromegaly. So you, you actually, obviously you don't have to exclude every single one of these, but certainly you should have that at the, uh, in, your, in your mind at the forefront before you make the definitive diagnosis of, of um, functional hypothal hypothalamic amenorrhea. This is why it's important to do that. So these are some case studies of some, peop some athletes I've seen in the last couple of months. Uh, so 24-year-old lightweight row, increased training load, secondary amenorrhea, suppressed uh, FSH, LH, prolactin up. Some of you might have seen this one before, actually. Any clues? Any ideas? Uh, pregnancy. So, um, and the clue is that the estrogen is, is decent, it's high. Yes, the prolactin is elevated, but that's normal in pregnancy. Um, TSH slightly suppressed, that's because BTHED has a molecular homology with TSH. Okay, so now a triathlete, age group triathlete, recent weight loss and presents with amenorrhea. So um, you could easily just jump in there and say, oh, it's, it's female athlete triad, she's lost weight. But you have to think about excluding things. And as you can see, the prolactin is elevated up to about, in the thousands, up to the thousands, you can let it go. It might be associated with PCOS or hypothyroidism, but that is definitely elevated. But the interesting aspect of this, which is why I was asked to, have, to speak with this athlete, is the IGF-1. Is this, the question I was presented with, is this uh, raised because she's an athlete training a lot, from what I've said? She wasn't doping, by the way. Um, so it's quite easy, in endocrinology, if you, um, suspect a deficiency of a hormone, you do a stimulation test. If you suspect an S excess ex uh, secretion, you do a suppression test. So you do an oral glucose tolerance test on, on this athlete, and the GH did not suppress. Therefore, she has, she is secreting endogenously, endogenously growth hormone. And in fact, 30% of pituitary adenomas are co-secreting prolactin and growth hormone. The treatment is the same, actually. You have to give a dopamine to antagonists, such as car, uh, cabergoline. But it was very important to diagnose this because the excess growth hormone could have an adverse um, health effect. So she has to be checked for guanomegaly, um, basically all the issues that uh, you have to worry about if you're an athlete doping with growth hormone. So it would have been very, so it's very important that this this process was gone through. Otherwise, if you had initially assumed it was a female athlete triad, you would have missed this. Um, who are we here? We have a cyclist, low BMI, oligomenorrhea, estradiol okay, prolactin a little bit elevated. I haven't given you all the information on purpose. What tests would you like to do next or what are you thinking about? Um, I would want to do, well, I asked for um, testosterone combined with HHBG, sex hormone binding globulin, and potentially ultrasound of the ovaries. This is PCOS. Now, the interesting why I've shown you this case is because you may be thinking people with PCOS, a little bit overweight, a little bit hirsute, they're not all textbook like that. There's this clinical uh, spectrum of phenotypes, so you can have a slim athlete presenting with PCOS. So my point is, don't make assumptions. And finally, um, a dancer came to me recently, primary amenorrhea, she's 22. Her GP had said, oh, don't worry. Why, why periods? They're a hassle. Don't worry about it. Fortunately, she wanted to get some further investigation, so she had carrier type, um, some bloods. But the DEXA was the shocking thing. So T-score of... Uh, less than minus 2.5, that's osteoporosis. So she has osteoporosis of her lumbar spine. Her hip is okay, and we'll come to that in a little bit more detail why there are differences in regional BMD. Um, but on further questioning, um, it, 
it transpired that she had really bad issues with absorption. Um, and so she's been seen for that, to deal with that absorption issue. In this case, she was given HRT because um, ultrasound of the ovaries showed that she's got an arrested puberty. So it's not obviously the long-term solution, but just to boost her bones a bit and just get puberty finished off, and then hopefully with improved nutrition and absorption, then she can hopefully eventually uh, start her own periods. So you might be thinking, oh, well, this only happens in elite athletes. But actually, in a recent survey, 30% uh, were amenorrheic, or female athletes were amenorrheic, and up to 50% had subtle uh, menstrual um, issues, such as insufficient luteal phase. So it is, uh, it's a problem or an issue that should be addressed for any exercising uh, female. You could still argue, well, maybe it's just one of these reversible training effects I've told you about, like um, increased cardiac output. If you stop training, if you don't uh, use it, you lose it. Maybe it's one of those. So you stop exercising and everything goes back to, quote, where it should have been. To test this hypothesis of reversibility, um, I looked at 57 uh, pre-menopausal retired professional dancers and their BMD, current BMD, reflected these three factors in a model. Age amenorrhea, duration of amenorrhea, and lowest body weight. And the lowest body weight was independent of amenorrhea, suggesting, of course, we know estradiol is super important, but suggesting there are other hormones at play here, such as IGF-1, which we'll come to. The other thing I want to stress is that there was no evidence of the a protective effect of taking the OCP. And it's hardly surprising if you think about it. After all, the oral contraceptive pill, the purpose is to induce a medical menopause. So it's going to mask any underlying amenorrhea. But even more worryingly, rather than just having a neutral effect, it actually may even make the situation worse. There's studies to suggest it suppresses further uh, the action of IGF-1 and other hormonal type contraceptions uh, prevent the osteogenic, the positive osteogenic effect of exercise. And also it reduces um, testosterone, free testosterone, because it increases SHBG. I mean, that's very useful. That's why you give people, women with PCOS, the oral contraceptive pill to bring down the testosterone. But that's the last thing you want to be doing in an amenorrheic athlete. They need every bit of sex steroid they can get. But you can see there's still a worrying lack of awareness of this link between uh, menstrual function and bone health. So uh, the female athlete triad, as you know, has now uh, evolved into this broader issue of REDS. Um, I'm delighted that we've got uh, an expert in this area, Dr. Kate Ackerman, speaking later. So I'm just going to sort of set the scene at this point uh, by highlighting the fact that it's an energy availability issue. So what that means is you take the total intake of your energy, you subtract from that the energy you use for training, and what's left over should be at least 45 kilocalories per kilogram of lean body mass. If it's less than that, the body goes into energy-saving mode, and as you'll see, the whole endocrine system shuts down. Of course, it's not just um, quantity, it's quality. Micronutrients are important. Dr. Mulwin will tell us later about the importance of vitamin D in exercising female athletes, dancers. And also, there's the absorption issues. I mentioned that in the dancer. Um, leaky gut can be an issue in endurance athletes. Effectively, it's a reperfusion injury. Uh, and this leads to lot less, lot, sorry. <laughs> Loss of integrity of the tight junctions between the epithelial cells of the gut, and so there's an increased antigen load into the body and, in, and results in long-term increased inflammation. Uh, the microbiota, gut microbiota, dysbiosis is relatively, can be an issue for athletes, and this afternoon we're going to have more uh, discussion with that uh, from Dr. Stacey. Why there has been quite a lot of discussion about uh, the valid or the strength of argument for having red as a model rather than just sticking with the female athlete triad. These are my arguments why we absolutely need reds. These guys, half the population. Normally it's the other way around. Anyway, this is Chris Boardman. 
He had to retire in his early 30s. As you know, he is an Olympic uh, gold medal win winner, serial world record, record breaker. Yet in his early 30s, he had osteoporosis and low testosterone. Back in the day, we didn't have res as a diagnosis, so he was given IV bisphosphonates, which, as he puts it in his autobiography, absolutely knocked his performance on the head, so he retired. So are we doing anything better uh, today with uh, male athletes? Well, uh, this is a male athlete, as you can see, very high standard. But he was having problems with fatigue, mood swings. It transpired that uh, he was being very restrictive in what he was eating, almost an orthorexic diet, avoiding carbohydrates entirely. Um, his DEXA was not great, as you can see. Um, borderline near, on the cusp of osteoporosis of the lumbar spine. So we've given him some nutrition advice. I've given him some advice about offload skeletal loading exercise. So he's getting there. In the meantime, his NHS appointment came through. By the way, I'm not bash bashing the NHS because I worked there for like 25 years, so it's excellent, but in this situation, it wasn't great. He was advised to take testosterone. He pointed out that it's on the banned list, so he couldn't. He then went on to s explain to the doctor what REDS was. So listen to the patient. Um, this is a slightly older cyclist, uh, recently uh, presented uh, with a stress fracture of the pelvis, diagnosed in a sports medicine clinic by MRI. He, was, he did have one other investigation. He was found to have a low vitamin D. But unfortunately, at that point, no DEXA was done, no testosterone was measured. Fortunately, um, I persuaded him to come into the study and look at the T-score for his lumbar spine. That's osteoporosis. And he explained to me, no one had asked him about his training load, his nutrition, and he, I mean, he's very lightweight, as you can see, but he had, his coach has encouraged him to lose more weight. He was reading articles in the cycling magazine saying you need to get rid of your fat. And this is a, you know, I'm, when I say an old guy, I think he was my age, but still, it's not a, <laughs> so I will, <clears throat> anyway. Um, but he wasn't, he wasn't like one of the really young, uh, you know, under 21 year old riders. So it can affect all ages. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, another example, uh, a male presented to his GP with fatigue, found to have less, low testosterone. Um, it was discussed and it transpired he had a very stressful job. So they said, well, that's probably the cause of your low testosterone, fair enough. He volunteered that he found that exercise helped reduce his stress levels. So it's fine, go away, do your exercise, eat healthily, excellent. Unfortunately, no one had asked him until I did, because just, I'm just curious. I said, well, what training are you doing? What exercise are you doing? And what are you eating? I mean, his training schedule would make like, uh, the Brownlee brothers look like really, really lazy athletes. It was far too much. And he was an orthorexic, no carbs. So that was really the problem. And this is an example. There was an article about this last year in the BMJ, exercise addiction. So of course, let's face it, all athletes are, have a little bit of obsession in them. That's why they are good athletes. But it's when you take it to the extremes and when sticking rigidly to this training schedule and this nutrition uh, schedule, um, is not performance driven. It was, I said, oh, I said, wow, that's a lot of training and not much food. Um, you know, why are you doing that? Have you got a target race or what's happening? He said, no, 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 because it is the schedule. I have to stick to the schedule. It wasn't performance driven. So that's the distinguishing uh, feature. So why are male cyclists particularly at risk? We're going to hear more about BMD later, but just to highlight why I'm focusing on these guys. Well, first of all, it's a non-weight-bearing activity, so you haven't got the mechanical osteogenic stimulus, especially if it's a, a sport you've been doing since uh, your sold sport since a young age. And even if you compare them to runners with similar, similar endocrine and nutritional status, as you can see, far more likely to have impaired uh, BMD. And even more worryingly, master cycling. I mean, normally we say, oh, exercise is good for you, it improves, but this is a rare situation where exercise, or specifically cycling in the uh, master cyclists, um, is, leaves you worse off in terms of BMD of your lumbar spine compared to sedentary um, adults. 
There's, it, it's a, bio, it's a, a biomechanical factor because rowers are also sitting down, obviously, when they're exercising, but there you're, you're loading the spine. Um, it's probably indirectly with the muscle pull on the bone, but there's a nice contrast there between the um, cyclists and the rowers. But with cyclists, the extra um, issue is that of the restrictive nutrition. Apart from the lack of the mechanical osteogenic effect, it's the low um, nutrition uh, or deficient uh, intake, should I say. And there's a, the performance advantage, it's obvious in cycling, because they love their metric cyclists, as you know. Um, and it's all about what's per kilo, especially if you're a climber. You've got to overcome gravity to go up a hill. So that's why it's a massive advantage if you're lightweight. But this compares to if you're on the flat, a track cyclist, for example, uh, because there your, your main resistance, not gravity, is aerodynamic drag. So that's why it's the road cyclists, especially the climbers, where this is an issue. So it's the, double, it's the combination of uh, the, the non-load bearing, the mechanical aspect, and put on top of that the restrictive nutrition and that's, that means a recipe for adverse effects on health and ultimately performance. But the thing about cyclists is there aren't any obvious early warning signs as in runners. So runners um, will get a stress fracture and, and have to stop. But cyclists, they keep pedaling away, keep pedaling away, keep running, running more and more and more into the red. Testosterone going lower, lower, bones going lower, lower, lower until like that other cyclist, you just take a, a misstep or something, and you get a stress, or he, I think he was walking a lot, or he thought he should run or something, um, and you just uh, add a little bit of uh, load bearing, and your bones aren't up to it, and you get a stress fracture. But that's at a much later stage than if you were a runner. So we need to investigate the solutions to this. Uh, bearing in mind, cyclists spend hours and hours in the saddle, and the last thing they want to do when they step off the bike is to do more ex another type of exercise, and they love doing their fasted rides. So it's got to be it's, we've got to have proof to show to them that this is actually a much um, healthier way of doing things, and ultimately to support your performance rather than potentially a deterioration in performance. So looking at the site-specific effects, uh, what are the most effective forms of exercise? So in very general terms, the, um, the hip is more responsive to weight-bearing exercise, and the lumbar spine is particularly sensitive to nutritional endocrine factors. So top of the list, something like rugby, where you've got a rapid change of direction, and you know, then they're not restricting their, um, their calories. We have runners. Endurance runners, it's true, want to be lean, so there may be some uh, detriment effect on the lumbar spine, but because it's low-bearing on the hip, um, generally that's not too bad, as we saw with that dancer who had osteoporosis in the lumbar spine, but was okay for the femoral neck. Rowers, I've mentioned, um, their loading um, is through the lumbar spine, and uh, Dr. Wellman did a study to show that if you're an amenorrheic, lightweight female rower, um, the, it's slightly attenuated if you are a rower compared to, say, being a runner or, or something else. Looking at the two non-weight-bearing types of exercise, swimming and cycling, um, the difference is, obviously, that swimmers actually having a little bit of body fat is a performance advantage. You need buoyancy. My son did a study with uh, triathletes and found that wearing a wetsuit over a 400 meter swim saves you 20 seconds. And that's even for slow coaches like me, and that includes taking the wetsuit off. So if you have an option, if you're doing a triathlon in open water, wear your wetsuit. But that's why there's a difference. That's why cyclists are worse off than swimmers. <coughs> so the other group why, that is particularly important to be talking about reds are the young athletes, so because they're already in a hen um, high energy demand state. So in my study, I did uh, I took uh, 87 youngsters, a three-year longitudinal study, and they conveniently divided into three groups of exercise level: the control girls at academic school, the girls in the musical theatre stream, and the girls in the ballet stream. The ballet st um, stream uh, dancers were doing. Uh, many more hours of ballet than the musical theatre, although the musical theatre in turn were doing more than the controls. 
So we monitor them, as I've shown here. And the findings were similar to Barbara Drinkwater in a way, that there was no significant difference between the um, nutrition intake amongst the groups, yet because of the, the hours of training was reflected on the uh, body composition, less fat, and also in turn reflected on the menstrual um, status and age of menarche, and this in turn reflected on the lumbar spine, BMD. I mean, the positive message from this, I don't want it all to be negative, is that if you get it right, um, that's great for your bones. So the musical theatre students, the sort of midway ones that were doing s quite a fair bit of weight-bearing exercise but were, uh, and uh, matched by adequate nutrition, they had the best lumbar spine BMBD. And why is Menarche so vital? This is uh, from the study. Uh, I've stratified according to months since Menarche, not chronological age. And you can see that the peak increase is around Menarche. And that's obviously going to determine where you end up in terms of peak bone mass. And that's over a lifespan. You can see this is the variation of BND. So it reaches a peak, peak bone mass. And then it stays steady, and then, there's a, then it all goes downhill. This is for a female. But interestingly, I could draw this graph, and I could label that. I could label that estradiol, couldn't I? It's the same graph. Whoopsie. It's the same graph for men, only it's a less, and the axis in that case would be testosterone stroke, BMD. Um, and there's obviously not such a steep um, fall off, uh, because they don't have the menopause. Of course, it's not, it's not just BMD, it's also the microarchitecture. Kay Hackerman's done studies to show this. It's the actual structure of the bone. My concern is that if you don't attain, optimize your peak bone mass, you're now going to enter the senior ranks um, of a sport or enter, this, enter a professional dance company or whatever it is. And when you do that, your training load is going to increase. So although you may not, uh, youngsters may not experience stress fractures, but as soon as they increase the training load, that's when the stress fractures occur, um, as shown by uh, Dr. K. Tackerman. So what exactly is going on in terms of hormones? So this is now a classic study almost, and I'm just going to whiz through the graphs just so you see visually what's happening. Uh, this is on a group of regularly menstruating women whose energy availability was manipulated through um, their intake and how much they're expending through exercise. Okay? And the next series of graphs are going to show you what happens over that five-year day period with their hormone profiles. So this is a representation of the reproductive axis. Uh, the hypothalamus releases GnRH in a pulse time manner. The signal is encoded both in terms of amplitude and frequency, so the two things. And if either of those two variables are uh, out of sync, then you're going to have an incorrect signal going to the ovaries and producing ovulation. This is reflected in LH pulsatility. So as the energy availability decreases, yes, the magnitude increases, but the frequency decreases. In other words, there's this disruption of the signal. So ultimately, this will lead to amenorrhea, ultimately. Just flashing some other graphs here, you can see decreased energy availability here, increased cortisol, decreased insulin. Over here, decreasing energy availability, decreased free T3, and I, uh, so, uh, leptin. Growth hormone is an interesting one. Although the absolute value um, of growth hormone increases, the active IGF-1 decreases, probably because of a change in binding proteins. This is what happens with the bones. There's a disruption of uh, bone turnover. There's an increase in the resorption markers, Whoop. mirrored with a decrease in estradiol, and a decrease in the formation markers mirrored by these two, with a decrease in these two hormones. So you can see energy availability leads to endocrine disruption. It's not just over, that was over five days in a previously regularly menstruating woman, oh, in just five days. What happened, but even within a day, if you have these energy deficits, whoops, sorry, in terms of, uh, again, the duration and the magnitude of the deficit, that has a knock-on effect on the endocrine system, both in females, increased uh, cortisol, decreased uh, estradiol, 
males, hooray. Um, I mean, hooray, they did males as well. Um, same, similar effects, right? So what we have is insufficient energy availability impairs, as you've seen, the endocrine markers. But that leads on to how does that relate to clinical presentation? Well, stress fractures, this were, these were runners. So for the women, you can see the amen amenorrheic ones. Had a, this is the black bar is stress fractures, much higher than the eumenorrheic ones. Males, low testosterone, normal testosterone. So there's a big impact on uh, bone health, effectively. The other, the other reason I showed you this uh, slide is because the conclusion from this uh, study, and this was um, authored by Louise Burke, who, as you know, is a top nutritional um, expert from Australia. The conclusion was that endocrine markers are more objective and more accurate, uh, gives you more accurate information that for on the ter in terms of energy availability than um, doing di diaries and things. I mean, listen, I'm not saying that that doesn't have a place, but obviously I'm very happy because I much I much prefer looking at hormones than doing dark diaries, I don't really understand them. So, but that's the key thing. We should be using endocrine markers far more because it gives us a lot of information. So this is what happens when you have a cumulative um, energy deficiency. In the very short term, oh, sorry. In the very short term, there's an adverse impact on bone turnover. Even if you don't refuel after doing a VO2 max test already, if you don't refuel with carbs and protein, your bone markers are adversely affected. And then as we've seen, there's within day deficits are a problem, and then over five days, even worse. But in the long term, actually, it backfires on the athlete. The athletes who's trying to restrict their nutrition to reduce body fat, in the long term, the body goes into energy saving mode, and actually there's an adverse effect on body composition. So putting that all together, I made a little diagram. Um, so if you are in energy, uh, low energy availability, as we've discussed, this has a knock-on effect metabolic system, increase uh, breakdown of adipose tissue, decrease leptin, and certainly in my study of young dancers, they had low leptin, the ones that were delayed in Menarche. Apart from the internal metabolic stresses, the, the external ones uh, for an athlete, worries about performance, not sleeping enough, feeds into the hypothalamus, the neuroendocrine gatekeeper. As we discussed, knock-on effect on the reproductive axis, also the thyroid axis. Interesting, functional suppression of both TSH and T4, T3. So mm, the normal negative knee feedback loops working in the endocrine system aren't working. Because if this peripheral hormone is low, then it should feed back here, and you should increase the TSH, but the whole thing is suppressed. But the axis that isn't suppressed is cortisol. Cortisol in itself has an adverse effect on functional immunity. It also interferes with the other endocrine axes. Uh, for example, prevents the conversion of T4 to T3. If, you, if a patient presents with thyrotoxic storm, in addition to giving IV beta blockers, you also give steroids to prevent this conversion. So this is effectively what's happening in the, in the athlete with REDS. Uh, and as we've discussed, the knock-on impact of all these hormones, sex steroids, IGF-1, T3 on bone. So that's personally what I would do if someone presents with what I suspect as red, because it's a diagnosis of exclusion. And also it helps put them into risk stratification categories if you, if you get some feel of their endocrine markers. The thing is, I enjoyed making those diagrams, and I hope you enjoyed looking at them, but the, that's not going to persuade the athlete that they need to change something up. But maybe showing them something like this graph will. Or well, that's what I do. I say, the thing is, you feel fine, you think you're fine, you think you're performing well, but you will never know what your full potential is as an athlete if you're in this, this red category. You'll never manage to get up there unless you sort out uh, the periodization. And these are specifically, you're familiar with this diagram, the potential uh, effects on performance in red. And again, that's probably the diagram that's going to maybe convince the athlete to change. But to emphasize, you don't have to have full health in order to be, have that diagnosis. These are just uh, examples of what you, 
uh, could be experiencing basically a decrease in, in uh, response to training, which is fundamental to any sport. I particularly want to draw your attention to this one, uh, neuromuscular skills. This was a recent study showing that uh, low estradiol has an effect on neuromuscular skills in uh, female athletes. And this I, I found really useful. I had a female ice skater. She presented saying she felt a bit off balance on the ice. And I said, oh, well, did you know? There's a recent study saying that that, and she, she had reds, by the way, sorry, forgot to say that, amenorrhea, loss of weight, all the usual things. I feel fine apart from feeling a little bit off on the ice. So I was able to quote her this study and say that may be one of the contributing factors. And literally, she was sort of sitting there like this, and she literally, she sat up and started to listen to me, because I could say there was evidence to say this was impacting her performance. Um, just as a quick aside, am I doing for time? Uh, she also had a problem, she's described being short of breath. Uh, she, uh, asthma, bronchospasm had been excluded, but, but this, uh, but she, I don't know if you know much about posture, but um, she was very lordotic like this and had rounded shoulders. So she couldn't breathe very well, rather than having, and, but that was, that was muscle strength. That was core control that she was lacking because she was actually quite weak. Uh, and, and in this posture, so she couldn't use her diaphragm, she couldn't do the lateral breathing you're meant to do. So I would urge you, that's how I uh, uh, explain to athletes, it is having an effect on your performance, Reds. Even if you feel fine, there, there I had two things that were causing her trouble, and I identified them, and so she was willing to listen to what I had to suggest. And maybe eat the whole banana rather than the half banana. Start small. So. Uh, fatigue. Now, what happens if you have an athlete that doesn't have specific uh, performance issues? Well, really, it's a context of time scale and degree. I mean, if you do this, you will feel tired. This is a VO2 max test combined with a lactate tolerance test. And this is an example of functional overreaching. So as I say, it it's depends on the duration and intensity. Um, and you anticipate you will, you should feel tired after this but with sufficient recovery uh, nutrition some re and some rest, you'll be fine. But where it becomes tricky is distinguishing that functional overreaching, non-functional overreaching, overtraining. So non-functional overreaching, classically described as a stagnation in performance, maybe there's a lack of heart rate variability. The overtraining, now we're tipping into maybe decrease in performance, lack of heart rate acceleration, but it's all a case of degree and time scale. If you have REDS, then obviously that's going to magnify, and as we'll see, there's a fair bit of overlap between them. As with REDS, it is a diagnosis of exclusion. So you have to do your usual medical screen, whatever you want to call it, make sure there's no underlying issues going on. And just a quick word about thyroid function. Um, so I want to draw your attention to this gray area, or rather, I should say, this amber area here, subclinical hypothyroidism. So that's when the TSH is elevated, but the T4 and the T3 is probably still in the normal range. So an athlete is like anyone you would see in the endocrine clinic. You repeat the bloods, the pair, TSH, T4, maybe autoantibodies, and see which way it's going. Um, there's no justification. As a certain doctor in America, he gives athletes with a TSH of two, greater than two, that's in the normal range, by the way, he gives them thyroxine. It's not on the WADA band list, I accept, but it's not good for their health in the long term. So, what are you left with? You've done your diagnosis of exclusion, the athlete's still fatigued, or you're still concerned it's reds. Um, we go back to this, my favorite, the triumvirate of variables here. And I was thinking about it, I mean, this is just a theoretical thing I came up with, by the way, uh, that the combination of training or the mismatch between training and nutrition is reds, whereas maybe the combination of training and the recovery, that if there's an imbalance there, that's more the overtraining. Of course, there's an overlap, because you can see these dials here could be high or low. Um, anyway, that was just a discussion point. So what are the strategies? Try and preempt increased in training load with nutrition. And pro and. Also, athletes, going back to this principle of taking responsibility for their health, encourage them to uh, monitor their training load nutrition on training peaks. I would encourage the female athletes to record their menstrual period, not because it's a menstrual period, because it's, it's an easy barometer of health 
of your healthy hormones. It's quite easy for females. And that would be a sort of a non-confronting way of them recording it. Right, last two slides. Quick shout out for older athletes. Um, this reflects aging without the confounding aspect of exercise. So you see, yes, you do get a little bit slower as you get older, but not dramatically so, and, and you get really old. Um, so that's good news. And so this hypothesis of there being a set point of exercise in order to uh, age optimally, if you do too little, obviously it's not great. If you do too much, as we discussed, reds overtraining, that's equally not good. But as with most things in life, it's, it's a nice balance you're aiming for. Um, yeah, so there we go. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.